educational psychology department at UT Austin, so half of my undergrads are actually pre-service teachers. So there is that future goal that everything that I teach them, I want them to be relevant. I want things to be useful for them, and then also 100% of my students are also students. So of course everything that they're learning about how to teach and how students learn is even more immediately relevant to their current lives as undergraduate students. So when I look at the topics that I teach in my course, here's an example of uh, the different things that I cover. Now I cover them and in, in, in the syllabus it oftentimes looks like one topic at a time. And maybe in the middle, I'll have some unit exams that covers a sub, uh, subset of weeks. But if we think about what is this useful for, it doesn't, it's not that, you know, um, dual coding and multimedia principles are only useful on one day of class. And then the next day of class, only expertise is useful. And then on the third day of class, only needs and goals are useful. If we're thinking about the context as to when we want students to use all these principles in psychology that we're teaching them, it turns out we want them to integrate. We want them to be able to flexibly draw upon these different things and really it's all at the same time. As a teacher in my classroom trying to actually embody these different principles, I'm not doing one thing at a time, I'm trying to weave them together. And that's kind of the challenge with our teaching. Anything that we're teaching in psychology, we want them to weave it into their lives because life doesn't come at you one thing at a time. Life comes at you interleaved. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember when I was at UCLA as a graduate student, I started um, being a, t my first TA position was for stats. And I also, on the side of it, started tutoring graduate students who, uh, undergraduate students who really needed help with stats. This was a fairly representative set of different things they learned in that intro, psych cor uh, intro stats course. Now, as I was tutoring these students, what I noticed is that a lot of these students were trying to brute force memorize every single little thing, every single formula, and in their heads, what you learned in week one was completely separate from what you learned in week two, which was completely separate from week three and four and five. So the way in which they try to study and practice was focused on one thing at a time. And they couldn't understand how really all of these hypo uh, hypothesis tests have the same underlying structure. The problem is, is when they got to the exam, it looks more like this. Exams in real life, they're all mixed up. Maybe there's a problem in which they have to flexibly draw on a couple of these different concepts. Or maybe there's another problem where they have to draw on a different subset of problems. This is the issue that our students face and there's quite a mismatch between how we study and practice versus what those exams and really what real life looks like. I think was it uh, Lisa, you had that nice quote where you know, mm, will this be on the test? Yes, but it might not be on my test. What does the test look like? The test probably doesn't look like the set of clean blocks on the left. That real test of whatever that test comes at you is gonna look something more like the uh, fig figures on the right. And it's not just the way that students try to learn and practice things, it's, there's a reason why they do that. The reason why they do that is because a lot of their instructional materials are organized like those set of very discrete blocks on the left. So Doug Rohr, who actually is only like a few miles away in the, the University of South Florida, he had this really great paper where he looked at the um, six very popular math textbooks here in America. And this was, I can't remember if this was middle school math or high school math or elementary, it's, it's one of the, it's a K through 12 set of math books. And they looked at the practice questions in these books. Out of the 13,505 practice problems, only 9.7% of them were interleaved. So blocking one thing at a time is really found everywhere in the real world, uh, everywhere in the informal educational world. And this leads to these big challenges for application and transfer, where we really want our students to be able to use this information. Because flexibly being able to draw upon your knowledge requires that your knowledge doesn't come in pieces, but rather the learner is able to understand underlying structures and patterns. That they have the ability to select between similar concepts. That when that new stats problem comes up in your intro stats uh, exam, 
that you're able to understand, oh, this would be better solved by a, you know, Kruskal Wallace rather than by a one sample t-test or whatever, depending on what the features are. And the thing is, sometimes these features can be a little bit overlapping. And you need to be able to accurately discriminate between what are the actual right way, ways to go about answering a particular question. So these issues of distinct of contrast, understanding category boundaries, it's really hard to do that when you treat every concept as its own discrete standalone thing. And then of course, you also have to have knowledge that is well stored, not transient, tenuous, or temporary. It's not just enough that you're able to do the application, but in, it's not just enough that your students can do the application during class or in that week or even for the period of your course. Well, you want to make sure that they can still do this later on. And so oftentimes we jump to these really cool application projects that we have students do once or twice in the classroom, but we never come back to it again. And while they might be able to do it in that moment, it may not actually be knowledge that lasts. And in order to flexibly draw upon your knowledge in the future, in whatever that real life test might be, it needs to be really well stored there in the first place. Now, from a lot of the cognitive psychology research that's been done over the last 150 years or so, um, this piece we've done a lot of studying on. We know a lot about how do you make sure you get a knowledge really well stored in there. And it's come up a couple of times. Um, it came up during Liz Phelps' talk today where we have this idea of making sure you're doing lots of retrieval practice. And especially spaced or distributed retrieval practice is a really, really powerful thing to make sure things really get locked in there. But what is something that we can do that will also support these other two aspects? <coughs> and I'm going to propose that interleaving is a potential tool that can be really useful here. Now, it's not going to be the, like, solve every single problem in education, but I think it's a really useful tool. And hopefully I'll spend the rest of this talk trying to convince you why. So interleaving, the mixing up, the mixed up practice of similar confusable concepts is really good for enhancing the discrimination between those concepts. Having that juxtaposition really highlights similarities and differences. By having to constantly come back and return to the similar things or different things that you've learned in the past, this forces you to repeatedly reload, repeatedly retrieve and practice those skills across time. And inherently built into that then is a lot of spacing that will promote that long-term retention. So let me just share with you a recent study that I published with my co-author Fari Asana. We um, went into eight high school classrooms in Canada, in York. And this was across a range of different STEM classes, um, sometimes just called science, other times biology, physics, or chemistry, across all the different grades in high school. The times two is where we had two classrooms uh, taught by the same teacher in science grade nine and biology grade 11. Now what we did is we asked these teachers, what are you teaching in that four weeks of like March to early April? And we basically then created four end of week quick, uh, practice assignments or practice quizzes. Um, they did this either the very first thing on Thursday or Friday, whatever was the last class day of that week. And these were really 12 minute quest quizzes. Like we said, you're gonna do, so, Let's just generously say they took 15 minutes out of the school day. That is some space retrieval practice, but I also then want to describe to you how we also folded in interleaving and blocking there too. So essentially what we did, um, the teachers did exactly what they would normally do. That last Thursday or Friday, whatever that last class was, we then had students do a 15, week quiz, a 15 minute quiz. They did this for each of four weeks. At the end of that period, we then waited yet another month and then gave them a test. So this was a test in, I think, early May on all the things that had they, they had learned throughout March. Now, for each week, we asked the teachers, what are you teaching this particular week? And specifically, what are the concepts that your students are finding really difficult? And so they identified six to eight concepts in each of those weeks. And we took half of those concepts and we said, 
we're going to quiz students on half of them and retain the other half as control. The end of week quiz, what we then did is we either had quizzes that were blocked by concept or they were interleaved. It was all those like three or four concepts that were be all mixed up. So every concept was tested by three questions. And then that month delayed final test, we had one question for each of uh, two of the practiced and two of the control concepts per week. Now, if we only focus on how students did on those practice quizzes, students did better on the blocked quizzes. That was an effect size of 0.21. However, what we're more interested in is how do they do on that final delayed test? Um, the delayed, oh, this is just an example of the different concepts from 11th grade biology. So you can see that, you know, week two was genetic bottleneck, founder effect, Hardy-Weinberg principle, and then we kept some Patrick, speciation, and microevolution. I clearly have not taken biology in a long time. Oh, and this was, uh, oh, I guess I got the date slightly wrong. It was throughout four weeks of end of March to mid-April, and then a week af uh, month after that, sometime in the mid-May. Here are examples of the questions. Now, of course, students wouldn't say, oh, week one target concept A traits. That's just coding for our own ability to know what goes where. They would just see the question. And so these are very conceptual types of questions. On that final test, here were the results. If they had never been quizzed on the concepts, the students got 46% of those questions correct. Fairly disappointing. I mean, all these scores are fairly disappointing if you are <laughs> you're a teacher. But this was um, not an exam, that, uh, not a test that they were prepared for. If they had received a quiz, so either the yellow or the orange, you then see the classic retrieval practice effect. It's quite a bit better to have gotten some kind of quiz on that concept. But you have almost a similar number, like stepwise increase between that blocked and the interleave quiz. Now what's surprising here is the, if the, the manipulation is so subtle. It, on any particular quiz, it's the exact same 9 to 12 questions. The only thing that changes is the order of those questions. There's no additional study time. There's not additional spacing where you see the same concept spaced across weeks. It is literally only the order on that particular like two or three page quiz. That's it. And these are the effect sizes. Right? They're, they're pretty impressive. Bridget, yeah. They were all different questions. None of the questions were repeated. That's a really great, great question. Yeah. And yeah. From the short. Oh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. What those practice questions, uh, scores were like? I think there was, they were lower. These were lower. These are a month later, so you'd almost ex expect them to be lower. Well, it was a smaller effect size, too. I think everything was just higher on the practice quiz, quizzes because they happened right after they had done all the learning for that week. The other thing I want to point out is this is retention, you know, with almost a, depending on the topic, it was either two, one to two month delay. And this is, the only change was an additional 15 minute quiz per week in the context of everything else the teacher was doing. Now, high school teachers are already doing really, really great things with their students. They're doing a lot of activities, demonstrations, they have homework, they have videos they probably assign, they have all these different things. These are the effects from just the addition of a 15-minute, 9 to 12 item quiz. That's it. And if we look across the different classes, you might think to yourself, like, well, there, maybe there's a lot of hidden heterogeneity. Not really. Across all the different classrooms, you can see it's basically the same thing, the same stepwise pattern across all of these teachers. And Doug Rohr has found similar things too. So he has in 2020 published a randomized control trial of math interleaving. And in his particular version, he introduced both spaced and interleaved practice where he took four critical concepts, these are the blue, purple, orange, and green boxes, 
And he had nine or eight questions per concept of these four ABCD concepts. And what he did is he just created eight worksheets that the students did across um, 103 days of their class where the items for any particular um, concept were either spread across all eight worksheets or they were on their own worksheet here at the blocked version at the bottom. He then had a nine, a 10 day retention interval where everything was then reviewed on a single worksheet because that's realistically what a lot of students do. And then a month later, he gave students a test on those four concepts that had been interleaved versus blocked. And again, you see a very large effect size in terms of how well students are able to retain and still use that knowledge. And again, these are examples where the questions that they had practiced on the worksheets were not the same ones as the ones on that final test. So is interleaving always good? I'm gonna say this right now very clearly, no, it's not always good, and we're going to get to that later, but it is surprising to consider how robust it is. So first to get a demonstration, um, I want to give you guys just a feel of what blocking and interleaving might be like for a set of materials that you may not be familiar with. Although I know John and Kara will have seen <laughs> these stimuli a million times. So imagine that you are an art student and your job is to learn to recognize the painting styles of 12 different artists. And you're gonna do this by studying six paintings of each artist. And what you have to try to do is you're trying to abstract what is their painting style. Because on the final test, you're gonna be shown new paintings you've never seen before, and you have to say, oh, that is a painting by so-and-so. I'm not gonna show you all 72, because that would be ridiculous right now. Um, but I'll show you a little sampling. So what we do in a lot of these studies, this is a very typical paradigm for studying the interleaving effect, is we're gonna show you these paintings by each artist in one of two different ways. Of course, there are many, many different ways you can sequence them, but let's just pick two on opposite ends of the spectrum, one which is fully blocked and one which is fully interleaved. So this is what blocking would feel like. You'd see one artist, the paintings by one artist at a time. So in this case, you're gonna be seeing six paintings by the artist Lewis in a row. All right, what do we think? Are we getting that sense of what Lewis's style is like? The thick, chunky brush strokes, the bright colors, okay. Now let's try it the other way around, which would be interleaved, all mixed up. So you can see they're different, but it's probably starting to feel like you're overloading your brain a little. And by the time you get to um, a second painting by an artist you've previously seen before, it might feel a little hard to think back to what that first one looked like and to really separate it. Now, here's the final test. You're gonna be shown new paintings you've never seen before, and students have to pick from the list of names who was responsible for that painting. In some of these experiments, they're also given corrective feedback on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, so they should hopefully have an idea and a sense of how well they're doing. And so we actually asked people at the end, what do you think helped you learn the art styles better? Blocking, seeing them one at a time, interleaving, having them all mixed up. Was it about the same? What do you think people said? How did it feel for you? The majority, yeah, say blocking was totally better for me. It felt easier, it felt organized, I felt like I could really focus on Lewis and see what his style was like. But if we look at what actually benefited learners, it's completely the opposite pattern. So these data on the right side, these were created by looking at studies where um, participants had learned half of the artists blocked and half of the artists interleaved. And so we could compare for each person, did they get more of the interleave artist correct or did they get more of the blocked artist correct? So that dark orange bar on the very right just shows the proportion of participants for whom interleaving was better. But then you might say to, your, say to me, okay, but what if it was just slightly better? What if it's just, you know, that they had, interleaving had just edged out blocking? So let's actually look at the percentage of the blocked and interleaved artists. It's not even close. It's actually a really huge difference. And this is quite shocking because they're doing almost twice as well with the interleaved artists. Sometimes they're given feedback and it turns out it doesn't matter if you give them feedback or not, they're still gonna say blocking was better for me. 
So here is an example of a strategy that can feel highly counterintuitive even after you personally experience the benefits. This makes it a really difficult tool to convince users to you, to people to use. Because that feeling, that fluency, the metacognitive experience that you have is that surely blocking was better. And yet, if you shift your attention away to, from how it feels initially to what your actual performance is, you'd see that it really should be the other way around. And it's not just that it benefits artists learning of artist paintings, but we've also shown this exact same pattern with learning different types of butterfly species, learning uh, very naturalistic categories, learning um, how to recognize the categories of these like cartoon, like man-made fish where everything's very rule-based. Yes? Can you just say how I, I Oh, microphone, sorry. <laughs> it's just a clarification question. So I originally thought this was a between subjects paradigm, but it sounds like it's within subjects because participants could say which way they preferred. Could, could you explain that a little bit? both ways, okay. and it turns out it doesn't matter. The effect sizes are basically exactly the same. Um, the metacognitive results turns out to be almost exactly the same whether or not you even give them feedback. So it's, a very, it's very robust in that it really works both within and between subjects as well as for various different types of these very perceptual materials, both naturalistic as well as rule-based, as well as things that we actually might be more concerned about in our classes. So learning how to identify what this, like describe research design, what would be the correct inferential test to answer a particular research question. Um, Fari and I ran this with non-parametric statistics tests because we figured that the psych pool students would be less likely to know those. Um, we also, other, st other researchers have also shown this with identifying the disorders being represented in different exact case study descriptions of patients. And this was the effect, whether this effect was found very strongly, both when the case studies were presented as written text as well as, as auditory recordings. And so you're seeing this effect very robustly across both very perceptual visual materials, but also as well as like these more cognitive and conceptual types of materials. And what I'm not showing here is that this effect is also very robust in motor skills learning as well. And in fact, this is where a lot of the research started with interleaving, is it started with motor skills training. Now, we can also look at um, is it that within the butterflies, fish, and artists, does it really work in every single case? Again, there's always these questions of heterogeneity. Maybe it works for some categories, but not for others. So here on this, we have the darker bars, which are the interleaved. The lighter bars are when that artist or that butterfly or that fish was blocked. And what the big takeaway is that there's really striking consistency as well. There might be a few where Perhaps maybe it's hitting a functional floor or they're very similar. But across all of these different categories, you're seeing striking consistency where interleaving those categories led to better learning than blocking. Now you might say it to yourself, yes, okay. But when I saw those artists' paintings interleaved, it felt cognitively taxing. And maybe we're all professors in this room and the and we would be fine with it, we'd be able to overcome that, but maybe not all my students would. Would this lead potentially to an effect of the rich getting richer, where the only the students who could handle this cognitively de more demanding sequence would end up learning? Now, we're always a little bit limited sometimes in that our, our convenient samples are undergraduate students, so here are some things that we can do. We can look at working memory span, and then we can also add in a working, a dual task to really try to load up their working memory capacities. And so we did this, Farai and I, with both the artist's set of paintings, so it's more like, let's clear what the rules would be because each artist is just doing whatever they wanna do and it's not like they're following a set of rules where this is just my style. And then we also did this with more rule-based cartoon fish. So here are the results for the artists. What we have on the left panel are when the students were under this dual task high load. On the right is when they were under low load. On the X axis for each, you have their O span score. So from lower working memory capacity to higher working memory capacity. 
the dotted line is when they were learning the uh, paintings in an interleaved fashion. The black is when they were learning it in a blocked fashion. What you can see is basically across the entire span, inter except for where there's floor effects and where there's virtual ceiling effects potentially, across the rest of the spectrum, interleaving led to better performance. We didn't expect it to look so perfect, by the way. Like, there's no reason why the end of the left panel should meet the start of the right panel. And we don't get that as nice and as, like, coincidentally perfect of a line here. But even with these cartoon fish, what we're seeing is across the board, unless you're at, you know, floor effects down where you are low memory capacity, working memory capacity, as well as under high load, the rest of the time, interleaving was better. We were actually pretty surprised by this, but I think this actually really is very helpful if you're gonna be a teacher, because it means you don't have to worry that much about the uh, prior ability or working memory capacity differences within your classroom, that this really can be very helpful. And in these studies, the, the students were learning something between six to 12 different categories at once. So you would think that that should also, in its of itself, exceed working memory capacity limits. Okay, but what if some people are just blockers? What if there are just that small subset of students who, who say, yes, interleaving works for other people, but for me, blocking just works better. What if those people really did exist? And maybe it's nothing to do with working memory capacity. So just looking at working memory capacity is not going to reveal who those people are. So we tried to identify these people empirically. What we did, um, so if you just, there was one study where we had, um, you know, if you look across all these different studies, you generally do tend to find that some people do better blocked. So the dotted line shows when blocked and interleaf uh, blocked and interleaf performance are equal. And so while most people on the right side of that dotted line, there are always some people who do better for some reason with that within subjects design on the blocked categories than they did on the interleaved categories. It might be that those were easier categories that this randomly, however those things were assigned. But let's actually see if it could be that there are people who just consistently learn better blocked. And so what we did was we had every participant go through three study test cycles where they learned the artists and the butterflies and the fish. And we wanted to see, were there some people who just consistently did better blocked on each of them? So what we did to find that consistency, we could count up the number of how many people did better blocked all three times or just two of the times or just one of the times or none of the times. But I think a better way was to actually look at the size of the interleaving benefit for each of these stimuli sets. So taking their interleaf score and subtracting it from, um, subtracting the block score. Because then you could see, is this person really someone who benefits a lot from blocking or a lot from interleaving or a little from interleaving or a little from blocking? And does that size correlate across all these different stimuli types? No. So there was, I mean, the 0.19 was significant, but I think that is a very, very small correlation. I wouldn't say that this is someone who, this would indicate um, enough to suggest there is a consistent blocker or benefiter. It turns out there really isn't, even though always across these different materials, there's always some people for whatever reason do better blocked than interleaf. Those are probably fairly idiosyncratic things related to that person in that particular like set of concepts. Because when that person does it with a different set of concepts, they're no longer showing that benefit. So interleaving can make learning more effective and efficient. Remember in that high school study, it wasn't that the interleave, that orange bar, those students had spent more time and had more questions. The only thing that changed was the sequence of those questions. And this interleaving benefit has now been shown in both lab as well as classroom studies across a range of concepts and category types, as well as across working memory spans and individuals. But that doesn't always mean that it's still interleaving is always going to be better than blocking. So if we think about the why now, 
we can try to think about what would be the boundary conditions, under what conditions would you might actually want to go with blocking rather than interleaving. Now, the literature has a couple of different types of theories as to why interleaving is better, and these are not mutually exclusive. So what I've done is I've grouped some. There are some that are about attention. That initial learning phase, how is your attention being drawn? How are you discovering the rules and the patterns? So Paolo Carvalho, um, for example, is one of the biggest proponents of these attention-based theories and says, blocking draws your attention to features that are shared within a category, whereas interleaving draws attention to features that differentiate between categories. So depending on how you're sequencing something, it's drawing people's eye attention towards different aspects of what they're trying to learn. Now, it could just happen that in the examples that I've shown, because they are very relatively confusable categories, that those are the cases where interleaving is really going to be better. But you can also come up with stimuli where that's not going to be the case, where maybe it could actually be really important to draw attention to the features that are shared within a category if those categories are themselves hard to figure out, hard if there are rules that are really hard to, to draw together and notice. And then there are also the memory or storage-based, retention-based theories, which is that interleaving, because it has you constantly reloading, retrieving, has, in, has you coming back to the same materials in a spaced manner, that really strengthens the retention, strengthens the memory of that. Now, these two really are not mutually exclusive. You need both. And so what I think is really going on is there's this two-stage sort of process that initially, if you don't yet know the rules, if you haven't figured out what those structures are, that's a place where blocking or interleaving could be good. If you need to notice commonalities within a concept to tie that together, start with blocking. It may be that a lot of times you need to start with blocking to get that part of learning. If the categories, however, also have aspects where you want to differentiate between similar confusable ones, then you want to interleave. So it's potentially possible that you may actually want to start with blocking for some concepts or interleaving for others. But once you get those down, no matter what, if you want your students to be able to retain information, have that knowledge that's not transient, tenuous, or temporary, um, then you really have to space it out. So you may start blocked or interleaved, but you should for sure always end up interleaved. So let's try to test this theory. What if we have stimuli that have hard to notice categories or hard to notice rules? So we're gonna try this and then I'm gonna show you the full set of stimuli because I think this is gonna be really hard. Here's what the interleaved condition look like for my participants. What word do you think this character means? Just take a guess. Your options are road, roll, soup, eat, or table. You have no real basis, okay. So the answer is road. What do you think this character represents? Your options are stomp, grab, damp, bite, or chair. <laughs> it's grab. This one, your options are dance, rescue, river, cough, you. Hey, cough. <laughs> this would be the interleave condition. Now here is the blocked condition. It's the same word, road. This one, what do you think it means? Same set of options. It's stomp. What about this one? What do you think it is? It's dance. Okay, let me show you the full set of stimuli to see if you can try to figure this out. What are the categories here? The left side of the characters are all the same down each column, but then what, what ties each column together? Furniture or, or wood. And the second one is tied together by hand stuff. 
Third column, mouth. Fourth column, water. It takes a lot to try to notice these and recognize these. It took a while with everything uh, shown on screen, right? So here with these stimuli, you have to discover the semantic categories as well as the visual rules, and those happen probably like separately in parallel. The one doesn't depend on the other. But then once you have your attention drawn to those, now you have to learn and memorize that association. And you gotta be able to hold that in. So we have both attentional stages as well as retention stages. Now in the interleave condition, so the block condition, you can actually essentially, you go down each row and you might have a chance of noticing this. In the interleave, it's all mixed up, so good luck. <laughs> so here are a set of stimuli where we could then create experiments that differ in their need for that first discovery attention stage. So in experiments one and two, um, experiment one was just passive study. So they didn't try to guess first, they were just shown the characters and then the answers. Whereas experiment two, that's the demo that you guys kind of just went through, where you had to try to guess. And in experiment three, we basically took away that need to notice those rules. We didn't give them the exact rules, we just said, hey, by the way, in Chinese you have these radicals, which are these parts of the character that kind of give you a clue as to what the semantic meaning might be. Just a disclaimer, this does not represent all of the Chinese language